we want to enter into our worship. We want to put all things of this world aside. We want to focus on Christ. We want to sing praises. We want to study his word. We specifically want to remember his death, his burial, his resurrection, that he rose again and he is seated at God's right hand. As we do this, we're going to begin with a word of prayer, and we've asked Brother John Hafer to lead our minds in prayer as we begin our worship. Shall we all bow? Shall we pray? We thank you, dear Heavenly Father, for this time that we have to come to assemble as saints. We thank you, Father, for the blessed gift that you have given to us in your Son, Jesus Christ. The opportunity we have to be uh, part of the family, his body. We pray, Father, that uh, as we have lived our life this week, we have lived it in an attempt to be faithful to him, that we've represented him well. Father, where we have displeased him, we've fallen short. We pray that you will forgive us, help us in our repentance, and help us, Father, to have better attitudes and better actions this coming week. We pray, Father, for those that are not with us, we pray for Sonia that she'll help her with her headache and that she might be able to be with us tonight. We thank you for answering prayers that are offered up on behalf of people throughout this land, family members in Ohio and on the East Coast and Kentucky and other places that, that are dealing with hard things. And we pray, Father, that um, you'll be with them and bless those people that have gone through surgeries. And um, we pray, the Father, that they will recover well. Thank you, Father, for answering our prayer. For those who've had treatments, glad to see Vicki here this morning. We pray that she's doing better. We pray that you'll bless us this hour, bless the song leader, bless the, the one who gives us the lesson today, and help us all, bless us all as we partake of this great communion. Help us to remember the sacrifice that Jesus gave in his body and his blood. In his name we pray, amen. Our first song this morning is number 34 in our hymn book. All the songs will be from our large hymn book this morning. Let's begin by singing, Worthy Art Thou. The soul. Worthy of praises, Christ our Redeemer. Worthy of glory, honor, and power. Worthy of all our soul's adoration. Worthy art thou, worthy art thou. Worthy of riches, blessings, and honor. Worthy of wisdom, glory, and power. Worthy of earth. Worthy art thou, 
Song number 168, Beneath the Cross of Jesus. Let's prepare our minds for the taking of the Lord's Supper as we sing this song. Romans chapter 6, verse 3. Or do you not know that as many of you were baptized into Christ, were baptized in his, to his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. In 1 Corinthians the third chapter, it talks about this same death and the resurrection that we have and that we should then seek what is above. It's interesting when you think about it, what we gather here to do is to remember his death, his burial, his resurrection, which then gives us our ability to die, to sin, to be buried 
in baptism and to be raised to walk in the newness of life. So as we remember this and his part, we also remember our commitment that we make when we die to sin, are buried and raised. And every Sunday when we do this, we are recommitting to that new, new walk, that new way of walking because we died and we were resurrected. Not like he was, not with that, not physically, but spiritually. And it is just as powerful. And it's through him we have that blessing. Let's pray. Our God in heaven, we are very, very thankful that you saw fit to send your son, that he submitted and he became our, the sacrifice for our sin, and that in doing so, we have the ability to walk renewed. And as we take this bread, uh, we pray that you'll bless us and bless the bread. Pray that we might truly recognize the intent of uh, our hearts, that our hearts might be turned toward you uh, in every way, and that we might be committed more and more to his teachings and to him as the bread of life, and it's through him we pray, amen. Our Father, we continue our praise, our thanks, our remembrance of our Savior who died on the cross and shed his blood and this cup that reminds us of that blood that was shed, the blood of the covenant that seals us as his beloved children and gives us the ability to walk in that renewed life. And uh, just be with us and guide us always through your son, we pray. Amen.
If you would like, let's stand as we sing this next song. And let's continue to, to honor our Savior as we sing Love Lifted Me, number 612 in your book. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained, stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry, from the waters lifted me, now safe am I. No. have a seat. The English Standard Version of Hebrews 12 verses 1 and 2 reads, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Prior to the lesson this morning, let's sing At the Cross. Number 157, at the cross. <laughs> Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my Sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head for such a one as I? cross at the cross where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight and now I am happy all the day. Was it for crimes that I have done? He groaned
Christmas song after the lesson will be number 341, The Way of the Cross Leads Home. Last week, we introduced the idea of the celebration of Easter, uh, which, even though I mentioned, was a week late. What I didn't realize is I was actually right on time if you were going to follow the Eastern Church celebration, which was on the 16th. Remember, I mentioned that um, sometimes they will not share the same date, and this year was one of those times. So we actually did do an Easter, I guess you could say, lesson explaining what Easter is, how it's celebrated. Um, you know, we looked predominantly at the Roman Church practice of it and looking at things uh, historically surrounding Easter as we are working our way through the various Jewish and traditional Christian holidays as they come up and making sure we are aware of them and their significance. If you'll also recall, what I did not get to was uh, what the Holy Day Easter is from, from a biblical perspective. I just didn't have enough time to give it the full treatment. So today what I want to do is I want to turn our attention once again to a focus on Easter, uh, though this time um, we still aren't going to have enough time to give a full treatment of everything involved, every aspect of what traditionally people consider Easter to be all about, because typically it focuses on the resurrection itself. But what sets up the resurrection is the crucifixion, which is an incredibly part of what they call Holy Week as well. So instead of trying to put the crucifixion and the resurrection both into one lesson, I'm going to talk about the resurrection next week and uh, the significance and discussion and kind of what Easter means or may not mean per se, for us, but this morning, I want to focus on the crucifixion of Jesus when Jesus went to the cross while, as the Hebrews writer puts it, despising the shame. Good morning. It's good to be here this morning together, isn't it? It's good to have this opportunity to sing these songs together, uh, to take the Lord's Supper together. Uh, to have this opportunity just to enjoy the fellowship that we share with each other as we join with one another at the cross. Uh, I really do appreciate the opportunity that I have this morning to open up the Word of God with you and talk about, I think, um, this week and next week, putting these two together is the most crucial and fundamental part of what we are as believers. And that is the cross and the resurrection. Hopefully uh, this morning we'll be able to gain uh, a deeper impression for the crucifixion. A, a deeper, I guess I should say, not impression, be impressed by it, but appreciation um, for what the cross really was meant to encapsulate for us and what that will mean for us as well. I would venture to guess that many people here have heard a sermon or two, maybe a whole bunch of Lord's Supper talks, that focus on the crucifixion of Jesus. Anybody ever heard a lesson or a talk about the crucifixion? Yeah, most hands should be up. This is a very, and it should be, a very common topic, especially as we are proclaiming the death of our Lord. I would also venture to guess that there are a number of, of people here who could, though it is brutal to think about, you could probably describe exactly what a crucifixion entails and what takes place, how they do it. There are a number of people here that have heard that information and you know <clears throat> about driving the nails and where they come in into the wrists and in the feet and the, the way that the, the crucifix was meant to put a person um, to where they would end up suffocating, 
the shoulders, the dislocation, all of that. Many of us have probably heard this and heard it enough uh, to actually understand it and to state it. And this is typically how we describe the cross, is it not? When we think about the crucifixion, we, we often talk about the horrible pain that he had to endure, that Jesus suffered so greatly on our behalf that he went through the incredible agony of the cross and how painful it must have been driving the nails through uh, the, the nerves that they would have gone through and everything that's involved. And whereas this is technically correct, I kicked something up here, sorry about that. Whereas this is technically correct, I also think it's important to point out an important fact. This is how we describe the cross. This is not the way the biblical authors typically describe the cross. In fact, it hasn't been until the last few years that I've really noticed this important distinction. And I, as well, have spent a lot of time detailing just how painful the cross is uh, and, and using that as the main way to talk about the crucifixion itself. Now, of course, don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not at all discounting the pain of the cross. I'm not suggesting in any way that the pain was any less than what we make it out to be. I'm not attempting to minimize the incredible physical suffering that Jesus endured. What I am trying to do is to place that physical suffering in the perspective that the biblical authors place it in. And I think that should be illuminating. When we talk about the pain of the cross itself, uh, and again, when we talk about the cross, we almost exclusively talk about how much he suffered and bled and the pain, like the, just, just the absolute pain that he endured. And really, this kind of begins with the scourging, the flogging that takes place. Um, and <clears throat> I, I think it is important that we put this together because this is, it's a horrific punishment in and of itself. What I want to do is show what the New Testament writers, what the gospel writers say about the scourging. Matthew 27, 26, and having Jesus scourged. That's it. Mark 15, 13, having Jesus scourged. That's all that's said about it. Here's what uh, Luke has to say about it. Nothing. Now, there is a mention of scourging by Pilate in Luke 23, 22. Pilate says that he's going to have him scourged as a way of bargaining to save his life. Um, you know, he'll do it so that hopefully he won't have to actually crucify him, but it never actually mentions that it happened. And in John 19.1, Pilate took Jesus and flogged him. That is what the gospel writers say about the scourging. Maybe it just might be that they don't spend a lot of time on the scourging because it is horrific in and of itself, but it's supposed to pale in comparison to the pain of the cross itself. And what they don't want people to do is get lost in the pain of the scourge, understanding how painful and awful this was and what it did to the backside and, you know, in, in the flagellum, how you had the, the, the stone and the metal balls and the glass shards and the whips and all of that. Maybe they're just, you know, we're not going to worry about describing and talking about that because we don't want to take away from the crucifixion itself. So why don't we go ahead and take a look then at what the gospel writers have to say about the pain that was endured during the crucifixion. Matthew 27. 
and when they had crucified him. That's it. Mark 15, 24. And they crucified him. Luke 23. There they crucified him. And John 19. <clears throat> there they crucified him. And discussion in any detail and in any way of the pain and the suffering and the agony that Jesus felt on the cross by the gospel writers during the crucifixion and the scourging, there you have it. This is all that they talk about as far as the crucifixion is concerned. I find this incredible. Whereas I have multiple times delivered an entire sermon explaining the painful experience of the crucifixion in all of its gory details, even directed people to maybe watch the Passion of the Christ for the purpose of seeing a representation which holds nothing back and is probably pretty accurate when it details exactly what is taking place in the scourging and in the crucifixion. I mean, obviously there are details of that movie uh, that aren't necessarily from the text, so you, know, you have to be careful. But I think they do uh, a, a decent job, a good job of expressing just how horrific this was. It takes less than two minutes to go through what the gospel writers say about the pain that Jesus endured, or, as the case might be, what they don't say. But even if the gospel writers don't speak of it, at least we know that the pain of the cross was a focus and a crucial component of understanding the crucifixion itself with the writers of the New Testament themselves, right? I mean, we would assume, clearly, we're going to see a lot of references to the pain that Jesus endured throughout Paul's letters, the other letters, and all of the other writings. So let's take a look at what we find from the New Testament concerning the focus that is placed on the pain that Jesus endured. You have 1 Peter chapter 2, starting verse 21. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. Now, if anybody would have been aware of just how painful Jesus' suffering was, Peter apparently was around. Um, he, remember, was there close enough that he made eye contact with Jesus before Jesus went to the cross, after Peter had denied Jesus thrice, and then they locked eyes, and then he went um, and wept, and he probably, though, makes his way back to view and see Jesus on that cross. So he would have a really good idea of what Jesus went through. Here Peter stresses that Jesus suffered. That's the strongest language that Peter uses to talk about the pain of the cross. That's not the wording that we typically use when we talk about Jesus' suffering, is it? Pain so bad that we point out that there's a word from the Latin that was made specifically talking about the pain of the cross. That is excrucio, or excruciating pain. What does he say? He bore our sins in his body. By his wounds, you have been healed. That's the strongest language concerning the pain of the cross that Peter uses. And yet again, does this language, does the way he described this, does this carry the dramatic visage of the Lord 
on the cross in painful agony as he looks to the heavens to ask forgiveness for those who are doing this, barely able to gasp out the words because of the pain that he was enduring. In this moment, in which it seems Peter is speaking directly to Jesus' suffering, the words, the language that he uses is nothing like what we would consider to be the picture of the pain detailed by an eyewitness. But hey, maybe that's just Peter. Maybe that's just Peter's style. Let's look at other references to Jesus' physical pain as detailed and focused on by the New Testament writers. And as you go through the rest of the New Testament writers and we bring up all of the references to the pain of the cross, we have crickets. They don't talk about it. The closest we have outside of the Gospels is Peter. I did word searches for hurt, torment, torture, affliction, ache, pain, agony. None of these words by any New Testament writer are put together and connected with the crucifixion event. None of the language that we use to describe and talk about the crucifixion is the wording and the language that is used by the New Testament writers. And to be fair, I might be missing something. I mean, this, this is, you know, research that was done within an hour or so on one day. Some of y'all are like, oh, well, you missed this one passage right over here where he mentions it. That may be, but I think the point still stands, doesn't it? Maybe there's one more passage that might talk about the pain that he endured. Maybe. But if the pain of the cross is the foundational basis upon which we are to understand what Jesus did for us, and if the pain is how we're supposed to identify what the crucifixion is all about, and it's all about the incredible pain that Jesus suffered, there is a remarkable dearth of discussion about this from first century writers. I find that surprising. Now, I've heard explanations. I've given explanations before. Why do they only say they led him to be crucified? Well, it's because they knew what crucifixion was. They didn't have to describe it. Everybody understood it. They didn't have to talk about the things because everybody already knew and could visualize it. Therefore, they didn't have to discuss it. I've used that argument a lot, and frankly, that's a very weak argument. That argument does not carry much to it. And that, that's true. Don't get me wrong. Don't, again, don't hear what I'm not saying. They absolutely knew exactly what crucifixion was. But if the pain of the crucifixion is the crucial connection to the cross that gives it significance, that is to say, when we think of the cross, we are supposed to think of the crucifixion in terms of the pain that Jesus suffered, which again, I believe in my experience, it is almost entirely connected in that way today, that would have been brought out by the gospel writers. Whether or not people knew about the crucifixion is an, is an irrelevant statement. They would have made the connection for us. In other words, we can't just dismiss the lack of discussion about the pain that Jesus endured and write it off as something understood you know, by them uh, because there are other things that are well understood by all of the audience that they don't just take for granted. They don't just assume that everybody knows about this and this and this when they know that they do. Things such as sacrifice, atonement, and what we're going to look at in a second, shame. All of these things, they spend time drawing the connections for us. Even though everybody would have understood it, even though everybody knew exactly what they were saying, they said, we want you to know this is what is ultimately significant about the crucifixion. 
let me suggest that if we profess something to be the most important aspect or the central point of something that, by the way, is the crux of what our faith in Jesus is, the crucifixion, if all of our language about the cross focuses on a certain aspect and we cannot find the language that we use in the New Testament, we might be guilty of placing the emphasis on the wrong syllable. And I really believe that's the case when we think of the cross and we immediately think of the pain first and foremost. Again, don't hear what I'm not saying. I believe the cross and the crucifixion was just as painful as I or anyone else has ever talked about it. I'm not trying to state that we have overstated the pain of the cross. What I am trying to say that as bad and horrific as the pain was, that was not the way that Christians in the New Testament thought about Jesus' suffering on the cross. They didn't regard the crucifixion in terms of how much Jesus suffered physically. When the New Testament writers talk about how horrific and awful the cross is, they use a different measurement. This was read for us just a few minutes ago, Hebrews chapter 12. Kelly read this for us, and I think it's really important because right here it tells us this is the framework by which we're supposed to understand the significance of the crucifixion. Looking to Jesus, the founder, the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is now seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Where we would expect... In our way of looking at things, in our way of talking of things, where we would expect the Hebrews author here to say pain, he does not talk about Jesus despising the pain. Instead, he talks about despising the shame, the shame of the experience. And I just want to briefly point out, this is not just the, Hebrew, the Hebrews uh, author speaking. This is throughout the New Testament. Read through the gospel accounts. We looked at the, the moments where they talk about crucifixion. We put those up. There may be one or two other, just, just a mention of the word crucifixion. But when you read through the gospel accounts, don't they actually spend a lot of time on the crucifixion itself? They don't talk about the physical pain or the elements of it. What do they talk about? The mocking, the name-calling, the ridiculing that came not only from the soldiers, but from in the, entirely, the, the entire Jewish leading council, the Sanhedrin council. They were there to jeer. They gave him our wine. They took his clothing, cast lots for it, divided it up. Even being crucified with him, cast insults. At him. And when the New Testament writers speak of joining themselves with the suffering of Christ, they don't talk about joining themselves with the physical suffering. They, join, they talk about joining with Christ in his shame, in his ridicule, in being reviled in the same way he was reviled. And when the cross is mentioned in the New Testament, as much as it does not talk about the pain, on the other side, it does talk about the shame and, and his being shamed by being on that cross. Even to the point where Paul begins his whole argument in Romans, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Because it revolves around the cross itself, which could bring shame. Now, doesn't that sound a little off when we think about it? I mean, if, if we were going to put shame and pain next to each other, and I would say, which one of these would you rather endure? Uh, which, which one of these, or maybe 
the worst experience. I, I bet most of us would prefer to go through shame than we would pain, just if we were just thinking about it. Sticks and stones can break my bones, but what? Words can never hurt me. And we know it's not really true, but the principle still kind of holds because we're taught from an early age to value ourselves. Don't listen to those who would criticize you and bring you down. Their words only have power if you allow it. In fact, the mantra of Western culture for a, quite a while now is, you be you. Be authentic. Don't let anybody else make you feel ashamed of who you are. Unashamedly do whatever makes you happy. And whereas I think we rightfully push back against that message in general, we typically agree, I think, with the principle concerning shame. So long as it is not immoral, unethical, illegal, do what makes you happy. Don't let anyone else tell you otherwise, right? Again, shame just isn't as big of a deal for our 21st century Western culture. It's no wonder that we resonate more. When we think about the cross, which one is worse to us, we resonate more with the absolute horrific pain of the cross rather than the shame because pain does indeed represent the thing that makes us the most uncomfortable or unhappy. So why shame? Why did the New Testament writers say, oh yeah, the pain was horrific. We all know that. We all understand how bad the pain was. But let me tell you what was worse. And this is how we connect to the cross. Not about the pain, it's about the shame. Well, I think first of all, it's hard for us to understand this because our culture, I mean, even though every culture has an aspect of honor, shame to it, we don't live in a predominantly honor, shame culture. And it's hard for us to understand what that would be like. Now, I'm painting with a very, very broad uh, brushstroke. Not every community that lives by an honor-shame way of thinking of things is exactly this. So, speaking with generalities. But an honor-shame culture is a culture where the individual is not an entity by himself. Every person is interconnected with other people who are of his group. Usually this is broken down by families, but it can be broken down into other groups as well, which I think is the basis for a lot of uh, the New Testament writings concerning the church. And that what you do doesn't just reflect you, but it reflects the entire church because you are part of the same entity, and when shame comes to one, shame comes to all. What everyone wants is for the family name or the name of the group or whatever to be honored, and if possible, to be raised or elevated. That the greatest thing possible is to have other people look at you, recognize what family you're from, what group you belong to, and then give greater respect and honor to the family or the group because of your actions. That's the greatest honor. What that also means is that for everyone who is elevated, those, uh, there are those who bring down their family or group. In an honor-shame context, it inherently creates a class culture where different classes of sorts exist, and there's a clear hierarchical structure. If your family had a great name, that's reflected in who you are. However, if you do something to shame your family, let's say you're a Jew and you decide to become a tax collector and join yourself with the Romans in that way, what you have done is you have now, it's, it's not your decision and it only affects you. Your entire family has now been shamed by this. And everybody that's associated with you is now brought down into shame to the point that parents had no other recourse than to cut off ties 
with their child who makes such a horrible decision to tie themselves to the Romans, to be a tax collector, they have no recourse. In order to save face and be a part of the society, which remember, it's so different from ours, they have to cut ties and send this person off. And even then, they are still pitied and lowered in the society itself. They have been shamed. They have been lowered. No clearer were the effects of shame felt than those who went to the cross. The most capital of all the capital punishments. The most shameful. Not because it was the most painful, which you could make an argument that maybe it was, but if you've looked through history before, I'm sure you have seen some means of execution that are actually more painful than the crucifixion. They exist. Crucifixion was one of the most painful forms of execution. It wasn't necessarily the most painful. But in Jesus' day and in Jesus' time in the Roman society in which he chose to come, this was the most shameful way that a person could die. Not only was it a sign to everyone that this son, this member of this family has done something horrific and worthy of the lowest form of capital punishment, which, by the way, a Roman citizen could not be crucified. They were, they, they were held to a higher standard. They were elevated. They were too dignified for that. This is reserved for the lowest of the slave states, and this is reserved for the lowest of the people of the lowest slave states. But if you are a Jew, this goes even further. In Deuteronomy chapter 21, starting with 23, if a man has committed a crime punishable by death, and he's put to death, and you hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain all night on the tree, but you shall bury him the same day for a man, for a hanged man is cursed by God. You shall not defile your land. The Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance. When Jesus hung on the cross, that tree, and notice the language, Peter called it a tree, right? And other New Testament writers, they call the cross a tree because of this passage. They're making it very clear that this was a shameful ordeal that's part of the law of Moses itself. This is the embodiment of what it means to be cursed by God. This is given well before crucifixion, by the way, was ever a thing. This is a curse that comes not only on the man, but when someone is cursed in this way, it affects the whole family potentially the entire nation. And if we can't appreciate how truly damaging it is to each person who is associated with such a man, just how much shame uh, you feel being connected to this individual, I mean, it brings you down in shame as well. If we can't comprehend how horrifying it would be to see your son on a cross, and not just because you are watching your son die, but because that becomes a reflection of you and all of your family for generations to come who are affected by this curse. That seeing your son on the cross is more than just saying, I can't believe I'm watching my son die in this way, but that you have been brought to shame, and that shame is going to stay with your family from generation to generation. And if we can't understand that honor-shame concept, I think we're missing a lot of what the New Testament writers are trying to tell us. What Jesus endured was more than just the pain of nails in his wrists and his legs and hanging on the cross for a few hours until his heart gave out. What Jesus endured was this. God himself, the one who sat in the heavens, the one who actively created all things, the one who is the receiver of all glory, honor, and praise, the one who deserves to be worshipped and adored, 
By the way, the one who never sinned, who never did anything wrong, he was the one condemned to die. While not being guilty or worthy of that condemnation. God and man perfectly united as God and man. Jesus went to the cross, which is the lowest possible point a person could go to as far as shame goes. As Paul says in in Romans 3, he displayed him publicly. This is a public demonstration of shame. Not pain. He put him up there so that everyone could see the shame he was going through. Raised above, high up, elevated for everyone to see. Naked. Forced to be the subject of everyone's scrutiny. Everyone's mockery. Everyone's ridicule. People who had nothing at all to do with him take pleasure in the little time that they have to belittle this man who assuredly deserves none of it. But they believe he deserves it all. Spitting on him, throwing things at him, belittling him in any way they could. And we have the accounts. Though the gospel writers do not recount any details concerning the pain of the cross, they recount the details of people who yelled at him. They recount the details of the people who mocked him who dressed him like a king and then spat on him and beat him. And by the way, the beating is not told to talk about how painful it is. The beating is a mockery of Jesus as king. These are the details that they give us to tell us how shameful an experience this was. They talk about how he went to the cross completely naked. His clothes were taken and divided. His inner garment was taken and they cast lots for it. That means he's got nothing on as he is exposed before everyone on the cross. The God of all heaven was enduring the most shameful experience that could be imagined. That is the way the New Testament frames the cross. Naked, exposed, ashamed. Why? Philippians chapter 2, he says, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a bondservant. Being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to, to the point of death, even death on a cross. This is probably an early hymn of the church. This is the song that they would sing. And what did they sing about? They didn't sing about pain. They didn't talk about suffering, the nails and the wrists, or anything like that. They talk about his humiliation. The fact that Jesus was equal with God. But because he regarded us as more important than himself, and you find that in verse 3, chapter 2, verse 3, he stepped into creation, he left equality with God in that same way behind, he stepped into creation so that he could bear the shame and the humiliation that comes to us. And not just that, but going so over the top, he is humiliated and shamed to the point of death, even death on the cross. One of the most shameful, if not the most shameful experience one could go through. Again, no mention of pain. This is all about someone whose status was as high as it could possibly be. He was God. But who then not only tumbled, but dramatically sank through the entire honor-shame ranking from the highest to the lowest that you could possibly go. As a professor of mine once said, this shows the upside-down nature of what the cross is all about. In a culture where everyone wanted to raise the ranks and go up, where the highest man there, the emperor, wanted to become a god, the one true god became a man and shamefully went to the cross. And it is here that we have to ask the question, why 
shame. What does that have to do with salvation? Interestingly, I firmly believe shame is the very first human emotion that we have recorded for us. In Genesis chapter 2.25, it says of Adam and Eve, the man and his wife were both naked, and they were not ashamed. That little tidbit, you know, the first emotion mentioned is being ashamed, and they have this tidbit, they can stand naked before each other without shame. They did not feel the need to cover themselves, but they eat what they're not supposed to eat. Chapter 3, verse 7, the eyes of both of them were open. They knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. Why? Why did they try to now hide their body? It's because they're now in the opposite of chapter 2. When they were naked and not ashamed, now they're naked, and they cover themselves because they are ashamed. Shame is the very first emotion experienced that we have recorded. And this is also closely tied to the second emotion that's given, and that is fear. Because when God came to them, because they were afraid, they tried to hide themselves in the same way that they had tried to hide their bodies. In other words, nakedness and shame are directly connected to man's sin to man standing before God, and to the source of the problems that man has created for himself, and that culminates in the fear of God's judgment. Sin, or I'm sorry, shame, from the very beginning, is a natural consequence of sin. It's the first natural consequence of sin that we find being ashamed in a naked state, scared to stand before each other, and before God, being naked and exposed. Now, I might be too forceful here, but I hope we're able to see this. When Jesus is stripped naked, and he is raised up on the tree for everybody to look at and everybody to see, what is happening? Jesus is taking upon himself the first consequence of sin. Shame. Shame that is associated with sinfulness. Shame that is associated with being a part of a sinful people. Shame that is associated with the sins of all of mankind who have created this condition of shame and continue to. In other words, Jesus is taking upon himself the sin of all of the world to see so that when anyone looks to Jesus... They recognize this for what it is, that it's their sins on the cross with Jesus, that he is experiencing their shame. Jesus is experiencing their reproach because it's certainly not his own. Jesus sinned. Jesus was not tainted. Whatever shame that Jesus experiences, it's not shame brought on by himself. He is carrying the shame of others. And so when we come to him and we look to Jesus for salvation, what we realize then is that the shame that Jesus experiences on that cross, why he came to the cross to begin with, why he left heaven and emptied himself to, be, to, to go through the most shameful experience that could be given, he did that not because of his own sin. He endures the shame because of our sin. That's my shame. That's your shame. He experiences our suffering. And by that, not physical suffering, I mean the suffering of our shame and reproach. And that's what he takes. It's not as if we deserve pain for our sins. And that's the point of crucifixion, that because you've sinned, you need to go through really bad pain, but Jesus went through the pain for you. That's not talked about anywhere. We deserve the worst possible shame for what we've done. And that is exactly what Jesus experiences for us. And when you go back to Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 again, looking to Jesus 
the founder, the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. If we want to know what it takes to make it through difficult times in our lives, we simply need to look to the cross and remember Jesus. This is the message of the cross. This is the message that the New Testament writers give us. This is what the cross of Christ is all about. And though the cross was painful, and it was exceedingly painful, pain is not the main point of the cross. Because at the cross, Jesus suffered shame. Who for the joy that was set before him, or as I would translate this, even against the joy that he currently enjoyed. Um, the word, and I'm not, never mind. I'm not going to go into it, but there's two ways to understand this. I take the way of saying, just like Philippians chapter 2, though he existed in the form of God, though he existed there with God, even though he was there in the midst of all joy, what did he do? Over against the joy set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame or it's another way of saying being willing to endure the shame and he's now seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Next week, we're going to talk about the end of this statement with the resurrection, that is Jesus being seated at the right hand of the throne of God. But that's next week. For now, I want us to realize not only that we may need to do some work on our end to comprehend how incredible the shame of the cross was. But we also need to be able to recognize how shameful sin is for us. That when we sin, it affects more than just me, more than just you, more than just the individual. Sin is a reflection on everybody we're associated with. Sin is horrific. The shame of sin is horrific. And that means the remedy must be horrific as well. And as we meditate on that this week, we meditate on how thankful we are that we no longer bear our sin. We no longer bear our shame. We do not bear this alone. We have a Savior who despised that shame and went to the cross anyway so our shame could be removed. Let's pray our great and amazing Father in heaven. How amazing it is to know that even though we have sinned, you still love us, you still care for us, and you provided the means for us to have a relationship with you again through your Son. Jesus, thank you for bearing our shame. Through you, the Son of God, we pray. Amen. If you are here this morning and you understand that you bear the shame of sin and that has never been removed, you've never had your sins washed away through the blood of Jesus, you've never been baptized into the blood of Christ for the forgiveness of your sin. We're going to sing a song in just a moment. The way of the cross leads home. We sing this song if you desire to make that commitment this morning to be baptized into the blood of Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, come to the front seat and we'll assist you. If we can help you in any way, please come forward now as we stand and we sing for your invitation.
Thank you, Chris. Thank you to all of you for being here this morning. And we invite you back at 5.30 later today. Is there anything else that we need to mention? We will close with a word of prayer at this time. And and, uh, it looks like maybe Bruce Beebe is going to lead our prayer. Or the, did, I, did I make a mistake? Whoever is ready to lead the closing prayer, go right ahead. I'm sorry. Okay, Jonathan. Sorry. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for this day that you've given us. Thank you for the time we've had this morning to worship you, sing songs, and praise you, and to remember your son's sacrifice. Be with us through uh, the rest of the, the week. Help us to make the choices that you would want us to make, and when we do fall short, uh, that we would be quick to ask for forgiveness. Thank you for sending us your son, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.